In the United States, over the last decade, 60,000 pedestrians died under the wheels of an automobile. One million pedestrians were injured. Join us for the next half hour as we take a look at perils for pedestrians. On this episode, we visit Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh has more sets of stairs than any other city in the United States. Snow can be a problem for pedestrians in Pittsburgh. We look at what aircraft pilots can teach drivers. Finally, the Veterans Administration does research on sidewalks. Stay tuned. We're in Pittsburgh talking with Bob Regan. How did you get interested in the steps of Pittsburgh? Oh, that's a good question, John. I was an um, avid bicyclist and I moved here about 20 years ago. Within a few days of my morning bike ride, I, I started seeing steps like those that are behind us and started asking people, what are they? And they just said they're the city steps. They all took them for basically for granted. And I decided that I would uh, someday map them all out and write about them. And I still can remember, it was about five in the morning one time where I was biking across one of our bridges and looked up in the hillside. And I saw street lights going straight up, about three rows of them. And I thought, those have to be the steps. And I bicycled up to them, and they were, and I bicycled back home, woke my wife and said, I'm gonna take four months off and map the steps. She said, okay, went, leaned over and went back to sleep. That's how it started. Well, it's, it's great you have an understanding wife. <laughs> uh, this is, I mean, this is quite some project. It took, uh, took four months to do. How many steps did you find? There are 734 different sets of steps, about 45,000 steps in all. Why does Pittsburgh have so many steps? Well, um, you know, Pittsburgh was the steel city. And the prime land for the steel mills because of the transportation on the water was along the river, river edges. So all the river edges were where the steel mills were and the workers lived in the hills. And so steps were built for the workers to get to uh, uh, work. And at first they were private, you know, just the workers themselves built them. And then the city started building them. And they really are Pittsburgh's first public transportation system. What's, uh, what's happened with the steps over the years? Uh, I mean, steel's gone, but the yeah. steps are still here. Yeah, the steps, you know, they're, they're, they've lasted. They're, they've been up and down, I guess. And uh, at one time, they were mostly wood. And then they converted them around the late 40s to all cement-type uh, steps. And right now, they're still used by a number of uh, neighborhoods. Uh, one of my... Uh, clues for finding sets of steps when I was exploring the whole city was bus stops because uh, there's a number of places where people come up from the neighborhood or down from the neighborhood to another road to get a bus and that's your bus stop is usually at the end of the city steps. And when you started this project uh, why didn't you just go to the city and say how many <laughs> steps do you have? They didn't know. They had a, a, a nascent database with about, oh, maybe a hundred sets of steps on them, but they had no idea where uh, the rest were. They didn't know where they all were. And so I, I did a very detailed mapping and it's a specialized computer system called the Geographic Information System. So it has a, a, a large database with it, with a number of each, each step has a number of steps on it, the year it was built and a lot of other information. And I gave that to the city, and they're using it now. How, how big a job is it to, to maintain all those steps? It, uh, yeah, it's, it's really big. And uh, as you know, yeah, I'm sure with you traveling around the country, a lot of cities are in uh, budget problems. And when I started this project, the funding for steps maintenance was zero. And then through the publicity we generated through the... Uh, through the book and through the interest in the steps. Uh, there's now two events here in Pittsburgh each year that celebrate the steps. The, the budget now is uh, half a million dollars a year for step repair and maintenance. And how does this compare with other hilly cities in terms of 
Yes, the number of sets of steps. Well, I, I, I as far as I know, and I've heard from other major cities, you know, hilly cities like San Francisco, Cincinnati, and some others, there's no comparison. Pittsburgh more than doubles any uh, sets of steps anywhere. And uh, the intriguing thing here, too, is that of the 734 sets of steps, 367 are streets. Conversely, 367 streets in the city of Pittsburgh are nothing but a flight of steps. You know, they'll show up on most maps as streets, and I'm sure confound some motorists visiting the city when they're going up a street and want to turn left on a particular street, and there's nothing there but a flight of steps. What's what's the impact on you know the residents you know having all these steps to, to get around? Yeah, I think it's healthy. <laughs> you know, uh, one thing I read when doing my research is that during the Second World War, uh, most of the servicemen said that uh, the women with the best legs came from Pittsburgh because they walked so many steps. And uh, in roaming around the city looking for steps, I encountered some fairly elderly people that use the steps every day easily, and I think it's contributed to their health. We're in Pittsburgh talking with Leslie Craig with the Polish Hill Civic Association. What's Polish Hill and what's the association? Um, well, Polish Hill is a small neighborhood tucked between downtown and some of the other larger neighborhoods. Um, we're sort of a conduit and a pass-through um, for pedestrians and cars. And our organization's been here for 40 years, and we're interested in uh, mainly the quality of life for our residents, issues relating to that. And it's uh, record heat today. Uh, it's tough to imagine what it was like back in February, but what was it like in February? Well, it was 70 de degrees colder to start with because it's in the 90s today. And it was in the 20s, and we had, I forget the total feet of snow, but it stopped Pittsburgh, and I think it stopped the whole East Coast, didn't it? Um, so basically, we were trapped in this neighborhood, and uh, as far as certainly only vehicles could get in and out, only a few vehicles really, and pedestrians really were stuck for weeks. The buses stopped, stopped running for a while, sidewalks were uncleared, so it was a big impact on us. And eventually, I assume the city got the streets plowed, but... They, what, they plowed the streets. They never did the sidewalks. The sidewalks were never cleared. They let it, they let it melt. Well, that's one philosophy. Nature yeah, put well, it there. They, 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 nature. Couldn't, they couldn't tend their own property, so I think they felt they, uh, they actually officially announced the day after the storm there was a forgiveness period, which went on for weeks, where um, they, they wouldn't cite anyone for not clearing their sidewalks. So everyone took advantage of that who, who felt comfortable doing so, and most people did not clear their sidewalks at all, ever. So a month after the storm, many, many areas, a lot of what you see around us was still blocked, except for what we got teams and volunteers out there, and we just shoveled ourselves finally. We got fed up. We realized it wasn't going to happen. So it was, it was volunteers entirely. The city never did anything about pedestrian stuff at all. Um, I, I assume that the problem must have been fairly serious that you, if you go through all the trouble of organizing people to get around to, to address yeah. it. What, yeah. what, what was the impact on pedestrians when you, when you don't shovel the sidewalks in the deep snow like that? Well, there's, there's nowhere to walk except in the road, and the road is reduced, and the cars are dealing with you know, that, that reduced amount of space that they have. They're, they're worried about slipping and sliding, so they're not looking for people walking. So it's you know, doubly and triply dangerous for pedestrians, I think. You know, you're, out there, you're out there with the vehicles in what's often no more than a vehicle's width of space. You're sharing that with space with them. So I know, I know a number of people who got clipped by cars and there were a number of news reports of people being hit. You know, serious. Uh, it's probably not the, it's probably not the last time you're gonna have snow in, in Pittsburgh. Um, what would you like to see happen you know, the next time there's a, a major event like this? The next time there's a major event, and we, and we do realize that was such a serious situation, they didn't have, they really didn't have the crews to do everything they needed to do. Um, personally, as an organization, what we're going next time is we've got, we have our list of shoveling volunteers, and we're just going to, the minute the storm happens, call people out and start that right away. It took us, it took us a week to realize we were on our own this time. So the next time we're going to, we're just going to get our people out and do it because 
the city does have a lot on their hands when you have you know a few feet of snow. You know they can't do everything, so get get people to take it into their own hands and do it themselves. I think that's the best way to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, in Terminal E, this is for all the passengers who can come see. We're in Pittsburgh talking with Craig Buzz Conroy, who's an aviation researcher. What can we learn from aviation safety that we can apply to uh, car, automobile, and pedestrian safety? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, uh, aviation works on the principle of redundancy, where you usually have a backup or a fallback system. If something occurs badly, you have another choice. Uh, Unfortunately, in much of the auto industry, we don't have that, but it would be a good idea, particularly for pedestrians, uh, the walkways, things like that. It might be good to have a barrier between the typical walkway in certain uh, resorts and certain parks and settings like that. You know, when uh, pilots gets his airplane, getting ready for a flight, what's the first thing he does that a driver might emulate? Well, pilot uh, first uh, walks around the craft, checks that everything's in place, is attached, the tires are inflated, and uh, if possible, the things they can manually inspect and, and physically inspect, they do, at least visually inspect them. Uh, not a bad idea for people who drive to walk around and you don't pull out with a flat tower or a, a low tire because you'd look and see what the car looks like before you get the key in the ignition. And once the pilot's in the cockpit, what happens next? Well, the pilot lives with a system of checklists to make sure that everything is uh, done in a proper sequence. Uh, wouldn't be, again, a bad idea for people to, you know, just a rear view mirror, just a side mirror, so make sure that everything is, is working, uh, check the different uh, accessories to the car, and then start it. There's been a lot of talk recent times about distracted driving. Uh, what, what, what's, what's the rule on distraction in pilots? Well, in the uh, aviation, there are two times when you have what's called a sterile cockpit. At that time, there's no talking except the talking that relates directly to landing and takeoff, and that's the two times where you have a sterile cockpit. Those minutes before takeoff and immediately after takeoff, and those minutes before landing and immediately after landing. And so the pilot's not text messaging or what have you? Pilot's not talking about, gee, I can't wait to get a good cold milkshake as soon as we hit the ground. None of that. It's verboten. In fact, uh, in 2009, there was a wreck where one of the contributory factors was considered there was a non-sterile cockpit environment. The uh, first officer, she was talking about non-related things uh, right prior to the uh, incident. And, and when there is a plane crash, uh, what, what sort of investigation goes on, and, and, and how would that compare with what happens when there's a, a car crash? Well, first of all, with a plane crash, there's a literal autopsy of the machinery to make sure it wasn't machine error. Then it comes down to weather or pilot error, and they're sort of nebulous terms, but there's a concise look at everything that contributed to the accident. If the pilot survives, then uh, he goes through a debriefing uh, as well as uh, the people who are involved. And uh, I think with auto accidents, we don't see a debriefing. People try to rationalize that the tree jumped out in front of them on the highway, things like that, rather than saying, realistically, I wasn't watching the road, I was texting, I drove off the side of the road. Something that they did that caused the accident. In, in aviation, there's uh, less forgiveness and less rationalization. And so what, what's the bottom line? What, what can you know, the highway people, the automobile safety people, the pedestrian safety people, what can they learn from what's been accomplished in aviation? I think distracted driving, just like distracted flying, is, is uh, quite often going to lead to fatalities, and that's something nobody wants. That's something that we can't uh, afford to lose good human life. So uh, I think those people that text, those people that are watching their cell phone or watching something else uh, and driving should realize that they're a second or two away from taking their own or someone else's life, and that's dangerous. We're in Pittsburgh talking with Jonathan Perlman with the Human Engineering Research Laboratories. What are the labs? The labs are a collection of different, um, different facilities we have here at the VA. 
and uh, they include um, a prototyping laboratory. We're standing in um, Easy Street, which is an um, uh, activities of daily living laboratory, which is sort of a, a space that we can modify for different research studies. Uh, we have um, uh, we have a biomechanics laboratory. We have wheelchair testing facilities. So it's a it's a collection of of different laboratories used for different research studies or different purposes um, to uh, to meet our mission to uh, improve the lives of people with disability um, through research and development. What sort of research have you done over the years on sidewalks? So we've had um, we've had a whole variety of research projects. Some which have looked at. Uh, for instance, which, um, which uh, factors might contribute uh, to somebody falling out or staying in their wheelchair when they're going over rough terrain or going down curb cuts. So looking at the effectiveness of uh, seat belts and um, positioning foot rests and different other features of a wheelchair in the right location as a, as a way to determine and to encourage essentially um, clinicians to make sure that the wheelchair is set up correctly. So it's it's, um, it's, we've, we've had sidewalk related research focused on that. We've also looked at um, other health hazards related to, to sidewalk um, driving and, uh, and propelling of wheelchairs, especially looking at rough terrain. Um, one of the, one of the uh, whole selection of research projects has looked at vibration exposure and that has, and we've demonstrated as, as would be expected that um, sidewalk surfaces and the type of sidewalk and, um, and, and for example, the um, type of brick surface and the orientation of the bricks that you see out in plazas, those have a big effect on um, the exposure of vibration uh, to the wheelchair rider. And that, that um, in turn can cause uh, neck and back pain and other um, problems. So those, those two studies we also have looked at um, and are looking at um, the effects of cross slope. So uh, sidewalks have um, usually for uh, rain runoff, they'll have a cross slope to keep water from pooling on the sidewalk. As you'll see with, um, with roads, there's a crown in the road for the same purpose. Uh, this, can be a, uh, this can really affect the propulsion of manual wheelchair riders who tend to, uh, because of that cross slope and the way the wheelchair is set up, they tend to um, head towards the curb and towards the gutter. And so if they don't have a lot of control, that can, um, that can push them off the edge. So that's, that's um, some of the work that we've done. Uh, and that's the, a whole variety um, that we're looking at. We're now uh, just in the beginning stages of a, of a study um, to try to better understand how we can measure sidewalk roughness and how um, that roughness could be compared to the vibration exposure. And the, those efforts are to try to set a standard um, for sidewalk roughness to make sure that people who are designing um, sidewalks and plazas and public spaces are well aware of um, what they need to do to ensure that wheelchair riders are not going to be exposed to um, hazardous levels of vibration. And so we're, we're doing a lot of work um, in, in that area as well. Now when you're looking at uh you know, the characteristics of a surface, uh, you use the word roughness, some people might say smoothness or level, or what, what, what's the sort of terminology that the engineers use? I mean, what, what is roughness? So, um, so obviously you can imagine lots of different ways to measure roughness. Uh, we we um, historically in this lab for the past 10 years have not been focusing specifically on measuring roughness, but measuring the effects of roughness through vibration exposure. Because you know the the goal of our lab is to um, to uh, you know to make sure that wheelchair riders are using the best technology and they um, maintain their health while they're um, while they're using their wheelchair. And, uh, and living, you know, in, in their community in general. And so we've, um, we've measured roughness indirectly uh, by looking at that vibration exposure. Um, the community, um, you know, sort of the engineering community at large, I think that one of, the, one of the, um, the groups that have really focused on measuring roughness are civil engineers, and they've done that um, to, um, to measure the roughness of roadways. And uh, one, of the, um, one of the approaches that they use is looking at um, essentially the, the, you know, the flatness of a surface over a given span. And they use the um, International Roughness Index to try to determine that. 
That is looking at um, assuming their suspension and, and the influence of the roadway roughness on um, how far up and down that wheel would go. Uh, for wheelchair riders, um, it's a little bit different because a lot of wheelchairs don't have suspension. And so it's a, we're, we're looking at other communities of engineers like civil engineers to draw from their experience on measuring surface roughness. And, um, and we're ultimately going to look and, and come up with our own, uh, our own roughness index, essentially, that makes sense from the health and comfort of a wheelchair rider and, um, and uh, their, their feedback on the comfort of riding over different surfaces, the vibrations that we measure over those surfaces, and then very accurately measured um, profiles of those surfaces using um, laser technology or other technology to get a sense of um, essentially connect the dots between an actual physical measurement of the surface, the, um, the measurements of vibration which have been linked very strongly to health implications, and also just the user feedback to tell us whether or not they feel like it's been a rough surface and, um, and they're uncomfortable riding over it. So we have a little bit of work to do to define that. Um, we have a lot of starting points from different communities of measuring surfaces and understanding their implications. What have, what have you been able to accomplish so far uh, in this particular strain of research and, uh, and, and, and what are the next steps that you'll be doing? Uh, the vibration research has um, generated a lot of uh, interesting findings looking at the wheelchair, the user, um, and, and the surface uh, as sort of a system approach. So we've looked at and have identified um, various uh, sidewalk uh, pathway um, design characteristics that are important in defining whether or not that pathway is safe or, or unsafe. We've looked at um, suspension wheelchairs to see whether or not um, those are having much effect on, uh, on uh, vibration dampening. And we found that um, in some cases uh, they're very effective. Uh, front suspension tends to be pretty effective at dampening vibration. Rear suspension is less so. Um, it's more effective when you jump off of curbs. So that's, those are some of the um, results from that, that work. Uh, we're also looking at cushions and the user in general to find out whether cushions themselves, um, we, we have a, um, some, some related research in some of our pilot studies that say that cushions uh, can amplify vibrations. And so we're looking at um, bet, you know, understanding um, better the, the, uh, how they amplify vibrations and, and uh, how a clinician might be able to select one that would do um, would uh, would try to reduce that amplification, essentially, to hopefully dampen the vibrations. So we've we've um, we've you know really honed in on uh, some of the surface characteristics. We we can now suggest a surface layout to try to uh, for sidewalk surfaces to reduce vibration. We can su suggest um, uh, some suspension and some room for improvement on suspension. We're starting to really understand cushions. And, uh, and that, you know, that from a system perspective for the wheelchair rider themselves, we have, um, we have a good understanding of, of the implications uh, and health effects of, of vibration going throughout that system and how it could be dampened or, or uh, attenuated or accelerated through that system based on your selection. Um, the future really is to try to, um, is to try to better understand and give uh, guidance to the people that are designing the surfaces, the sidewalk surfaces, to give better guidance to the wheelchair designers um, for suspension and guidance to the cushion manufacturers. And, uh, and so that's our next step is to really, for the surface characteristics, we want to, like I mentioned previously, understand how users um, personally feel when they're going over a surface and connect that to uh, vibration exposure and um, actual uh, surface uh, roughness measurements and having that um, having that data combined allows us to give uh, to give really good advice to the people that are designing sidewalk surfaces and and public spaces and so that's the next step is to take what we've learned in the laboratory and what we've learned from collecting vibration exposure out in the community and uh, develop uh, clear guidelines for people that are uh, that are designing these these um, these surfaces or these wheelchairs, so they know how to improve uh, approve upon what they they currently have. 
and you know, in, in time, when you've got your results, you know what services work and, and what to avoid. Uh, how does that make its way from your your lab here in Pennsylvania out to you know the world at large? Uh, you know, the, the people that actually build sidewalks and plazas. Sure. So we, um, you know, when we're doing the actual applied research, we generally publish in in um, publications that are just reviewed by other scientists and engineers. As we get further along and start to work with um, with standards committees and, and uh, groups of professional organizations that integrate people from um, not only the scientific research community but the uh, the uh, in industry in general, um, then they'll uh, we'll develop those standards together and they'll be become international standards and and uh, everybody will refer to them. So so the evolution. Um, of this work will probably be into um, an ISO committee or some ANSI, ANSI committee to standardize uh, the techniques for measurement and uh, upper lower bounds for, um, for roughness or, or vibration exposure. That'll be one way to disseminate the work so uh, the industry knows, um, is, is aware and our research influences um, those industry standards. Other ways are just through, um, through trade magazines and, and publications that are generally reviewed uh, more by you know by the by the folks that are actually designing these um, these applications so the work um, does move from this more research and scientific publication focused um, uh, outlet to to something that is is uh, becomes a standard that everybody refers to and then you got a little goodie here what uh... oh I just wanted to I just wanted to show some of the instrumentation. So there's, uh, you know, this is a sit bar. It's a standardized. This goes back to, uh, uh, again, referring to um, the ISO standards. When we measure vibration exposure into the body, um, this is, a, this is a, an application of just an indenter. So you sit on this, and it indents into the cushion. Uh, this is an interesting um, part and, and demonstrates what can often be difficult about our research um, with wheelchair riders is that this is dangerous, this is, uh, for anybody with sensation, this is fine to sit on and is a standardized way to, to measure vibration. For a wheelchair rider who might have lost sensation, this is a very dangerous thing to sit on. We often have to come up with our own instrumentation that might not be, be, um, be widely used. So we do a lot of, you know, when we're measuring vibration out in the community, we come up with that instrumentation because it's not available off the shelf. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.